Hello. Welcome back. So I was up really late last night, way past 2 a.m. working on this um, um, parser. And it does a lot, a lot more now. It's not ready, but it's pretty close. So where we left off, left off in the uh, previous part was um, we'd started working on the parser. We'd done the, the scanner and we started working on the parser. We could get some, uh, some, some basic stuff parsed. And now I'm actually parsing most of the, I think actually the complete example function that we have here. Let's move these parse test data to the end here so we can look at it. Um, so here's the, here's the input that we're parsing. A uh, couple of changes since uh, the last time. First off, comments. I'm now just skipping comments. They are not, you know, the um, let's advance. Let's see. So as we're as we're scanning the input for tokens and tokenizing it, when we are scanning comments, um, I am at this point just kind of ignoring that comment, not producing any um, uh, any token for it. But then just like rerun, like just going ahead and parsing the next token, right? Which might be another comment, and it keeps going. So uh, essentially, we can we can uh, swap these two lines here, and now this is probably not going to work. But yeah, it's got to complain. But now we're we're getting uh, comment tokens as well. So that allows us to we still you know that allows us to in the future do things like using the parser just to do pretty printing and formatting and stuff like that. So we're going to need to scan the comment anyways to know where it ends and it's uh, the same amount of work as producing a token for it so anyhow that's kind of neat so i'm doing that a couple of other things uh i cleaned up the naming so the other day when we were putting this together uh we just used some names just to get going since since uh, a person like this at least this person gets a little bit long in terms of there's a lot of functions, a lot of lines of code and stuff like that. It's kind of nice to have some sort of naming scheme going. So what I've settled on for now at least is that a prefix S is for, for scanning the tokens, tokenizing. So S advanced advances the, the scanning state. Uh, S reg means that we're scanning a register uh, token and so on. S name, scanning a name. And then P is for um, uh, parse functions. So parse a statement. Uh, there are a couple of things that don't follow this that are just sort of just so common and nice that you know they don't have it. But generally speaking, there's a uh, there's there's this sort of like naming thing going on. Uh, so and then we have a couple of functions called, that starts with make or mk for just creating nodes. Right now there are three versions of these. There's make node that just creates whatever node, whatever token is currently out there. There's one that, that creates a list. So explicitly sets the, no matter what the token is, explicitly sets it to the type of node to be a list. And I use the LPREN, left parentheses for that. We get a, a, a nil node. Um, this is what we called bad or bad node in the previous uh, part. In some cases, it might be useful to represent nil as well as bad. So kind of use it for both things. And TN is just zero. And so, you know, that's that. Now we're, we don't have that going on here, but I think, let's see, is it if the params are empty? Let's try it. There's some condition. Oh, I guess we have a bug. We can fix that. Um, there's some condition where I will just do nil. Maybe it's this case. Yeah. And so we can see here if I toggle this back on. So let's look at what we've been parsing here. So first off here, we're still just printing out as we did in the previous part, the old tokens that we're scanning of the source. And there's quite a lot now since we're parsing the full function. You know, so we get the, the function token and then a name and then parenthesis and so on. Uh, and those, we interpret those and assign meaning to those. That's what the parser does. And so the, the little parentheses here um, denote sort of like a, a logical grouping, like a, it's an S expression kind of thing. Then the, the first thing in, the, in, in it, unless there's a space, uh, is the type of this group. So like this type of group is a function. So this will be the same as a token. And then comes a, a set of fields 
so the first field is just the name of the function. Then we have, and so parenthesis, we use the space after it's just a list. And then we have a list of parameters. So we have n and j, <clears throat> they have types here. It also allows us to do things like uh, not naming it. And then it, we have first here a, um, a named parameter, n it's type i32, and then we have an unnamed one, and then we just use the type. We don't, uh, we don't create this sort of like a little, little tuple of name and type. And the next thing, and just getting back to the, the nil insertion here. And then the, the next thing that we parse here is the results, which can be a list of things. It can be, you know, or I have something. It can be uh, uh, several results, right? Since in our ISA, input parameters and output results are kind of treated the same way, at least for now. So same thing here, really it's the same syntax, it's just parentheses missing uh, or absent from the result here. It's just to make this not ambiguous or anything like that. And what happens if a function doesn't return anything, right? We could just do this, right? Kind of like see like or whatnot and say the result type of this function is like nothing. I've always found that a little bit weird and I understand why, why void is needed in a C function. I guess it's the main function, but let's see. So like, you know, if we remove this, like parsing this in, in C would be tricky, right? Since is this like a type or whatever? So void kind of serves that purpose and other purposes. But since we have this trailing style, um, we don't really need this. We can just like leave it out to say that this function doesn't, doesn't return any values. And when the parser gets to this point here, right here, we will see if, if we have anything before the, this, uh, either the, the line end or the start of a block. If we have anything here, it'll parse it like we just did here, right? And we'll create this list of result types. In this case, it's just a single one, A. And if nothing is in there, we'll insert nil. And this is gonna make things like much easier for us later. Another option here would be to just leave that out, right? And so uh, the, the tricky thing with doing that is that we would have a variable length of this uh, function list, right? So then when we do things later, like generate code from this to do analysis on this, we would have to every time like go and count the length of the function list to know if it has any results. Um, and so this way we just keep it simple for ourselves. If the if uh, item number two in its list here is uh, is nil, we know that there are no results. And if it's not, we know that there are results and, and uh, all the opposites are the same. Anyhow, so that's how we can make use of nil. Anyhow, the rest is kind of self-explanatory. I think the differences from the other day. Uh, so I'm a little sip of coffee. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is um, how this is kind of different from usually the parses I'll work on. Uh, in this case, we have we have this. Let's see. How should we? Um, Let's, let's grab this and put it into a new file. Uh, do, 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 we'll do this. Okay, this would be good. Um, let's do syntax CO2 or something like that. It'll match pretty well. Okay, so in, uh, and actually our syntax changed a little bit. We now have these curly braces to, to tell where the function starts being. Anyhow, so in, in many cases, we might have some sort of, um, you know, uh, nested things and structures in here, right? So we might have like a block and, you know, a block and so on, right? And these might be statements or they might not be, and uh, we might have labels or not. However, in our simple little syntax here, we've made it, we've, we've really constrained the, the, the problem space or the syntax here. Um, and we're also at the level where we're just dealing with these essentially logical blocks of a function, right? So this function has three blocks. Here's the first block, here's the second one, and here's the uh, third block, right? And if we just leave out this label, right? We have an implicit first block here. If we leave out this label, we also have two blocks now, right? 
And what's kind of neat about this, and I was I was going back and forth last night about, you know, should uh should I try to just go straight to some sort of SSA form, which makes things like uh code generation and redish allocation maybe a little simpler. Um and I sketch out some things and I'll, and this is why I'm so on Twitter. Uh and I sketch out some things um and realize that it would probably a bit of overkill. Maybe one day it would be neat to streamline the parser to just go straight to some sort of uh, SSA form. And in SSA form, we talked about this in the previous part, um, but a quick recap, let's see. Uh, so let's see, we have this. Adidas, okay. So early on, this might actually be in the first part. Yeah, I think this is in part one. If if you want to go back and 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 listen to like the the thinking around this and uh and stuff like that. Anyhow, so one of the forms we considered for this like assembly language um, was SSA style, and I ruled that out pretty quickly since you have to deal with with five nodes, so kind of fusing different paths together and stuff like that. This is great for machines, but kind of awkward for humans. Any else has the same form. Also, like you, you only assign to something once, right? Um, or bind rather. So this is kind of what SSA the SSA form of that function will look like. I guess we can just copy that into our um, sketch file here. Okay. So this is the SSA style of it, and. I realized that a middle ground here is just to say that a function, like whenever we're parsing this function, the structure of this is not a set of statements, but it is a, a set of blocks. So a function is not a list of statements, it's a list of blocks. And if you leave out that first block, I synthesize the first block, sort of like an implicit first block, rather than, you know, saying that, you know, you can do this or that. And that greatly simplified the parser. First off, I didn't do that. And it, you know, I was scratching my head a lot. I was like, oh, how should I handle this, right? Like this kind of case where you get statements and then you get a block, right? Which is kind of logically this, um, at least that's what I want it to be. It's gonna be, I think it will make things easier later down. So now this, the function now is always, um, so this box, let's see, I have a, oh, I have it next here. So I sketched out the syntax a little bit. This, I guess, is some boring ass BNF-ish. Um, but the, the point here is having some sort of like formal expression of what the syntax is supposed to be is I think going to be helpful. At least it was for me last night. But then again, I was kind of tired at the end. So I don't know if it's as useful anymore, but I keep this. So my screen obviously is much bigger than what I'm uh, recording here. So I'm keeping this in a different part of my screen that's outside of the recording, but uh, as, a, as a little reference to myself. And so what we have here is uh, the function definition. You know, we've looked at that. The function body here starts with the curly braces, ends with curly braces, and then it has a block. And this is kind of what I was talking about. So a function is not, a function's body is not like a list of like just some statements. It's more structured than that. It's a list of blocks. And a block is either anonymous or um, or not. So anonymous block will be just the very first block. There's no other block can be anonymous. Or really, I think at this point, I might actually remove this and simplify this. So I'll show you in a minute what I ended up doing. And a label block, right, is as we as we looked at is what we have here. Um, a block that we called something like B0, right? B1 end. And a block itself contains some name, excuse me, um, some name. I haven't come up with a good name here. Let's call it like statement one. <laughs> it's a block statement, maybe. Block statement, since it's like not any statement. Uh, since you know anything could be a statement like a function definition, um, so a block statement it's at least one of them. Since like a block, just two labels following each other, I think should be valid. But if we want to make them valid, we can just do that. 
it's it's uh, zero or more. This is one or more of these. It's and it's either an operation or an assignment, and I think that's it actually. I think that's it. Uh, uh, an assignment will look something like this. Uh, register three is you know add register one and register four maybe I don't know. Or it can be a local name once we implement locals, right? You can do you know, x, y, y, and z. Right? And an operation is something that doesn't have the equal sign in between. And that is specifically a, uh, a name, so it would not be a register. So something like uh, branch if zero. Uh, so register, I don't know, one, go to end. Is that, let's just make sure I'm not messing this up. Yeah. So and it's really simple. Uh, and then the arguments are, you know, it's an example, right? It's like, it's it's what we see here. You know, I need to write an example of that, right? So. These are arguments, right? It's either a register or a name local, like Y here, um, or a literal. Right? We add one to Y, for example. And a literal uh, should define that. So there are uh, int literal. Yes, int lit. Int lit. So it's like a, I don't know. Something funny. Um, so it's either uh, a decimal one. Let's see. So we either have it's a zero x, and then uh, zero two nine, a two f, right, and low face. And we have an optional, like negative sign for all of these, right? And then we have a, let's call that a uh, hex literal. The one of hex lit, we have bin, uh, bin lit. Uh, binary literal, we have a decimal literal, and hex literal. So the, uh, the bin literal starts with a B and has one or more of zero and one. Oop. And the decimal literal does not begin with any of those. It does that. It actually says here tonight. Yeah, I know this is not like some valid BNF or whatever, but it's not for a machine. Um, okay, I think that's it. And then maybe one day we'll have string literals, but no, no, it's just integral literals. Maybe floating point literals at some point. So I think that's this is pretty much the the syntax. Let's move the outside of the screen. Okay, so the implicit block. So let's go back here and just try it out. So now we have a name block here, block zero, right? So we're talking about a function is strictly a list of blocks, not just random statements. So what happens if we do this, right? Like how do we handle this? You're gonna see that we still get B zero here. There's still a block here. So we have, here's a block B zero, here's a block one. And here we have the final block. Right. And it corresponds to this. Um, and I think it's kind of, I think it ended, ended up being kind of elegant. Uh, so we have a function here for parsing the uh, the function definition. And this, let me just show you. So this is triggered when we find a uh, fun token, right? So F U N token. And it does kind of what you would expect, right? It uh, it, it it grabs a name as the last one, you know, and it, it reports 
an error if it doesn't get a name, and uh, it reads the parameters that are enclosed in parentheses, and then it reads an optional uh, list of results. And we use the, reuse the same function here as the parameters because they have the same format. And then comes the body. And so we begin with, we, we always want a, and you know, we, what we could do here actually, we could do if, um, oops. Uh, semi. So we can do this if we wanted to allow just function definitions without a body. So this allows us to do this. Um, so now we're going to get a, let's see. Oh, did I make a mistake here? Oh, no, I didn't. We're just printing things out in a weird way. Um, and actually, let me silence these token, token printing things. I think we have, what is that? Plans. Oh yeah, we have this macro. So let's just uncomment that. Since every top level thing, we that's when we print out, that's why we didn't see them. So now we get a, uh, now we allow sort of forward declarations, if you will, or like external declarations, whatever you want to call them, sort of a, a, a declaration of a function existing. It's only its signature, but not its implementation. If you wanted to, um, let's say you could put source code in multiple files, it might be useful to do this. Some some popular IRs like have this, like LLVM's IR, for example, does this rather than using includes or anything like that. You just kind of you just kind of punch in the signature of a function that's defined somewhere else. Um, and then you can use that somewhere like this. And the uh, its little parser can then tell you that like, oh, you're, you're giving it the right or the wrong uh, arguments. So as it says that if we wanted to support uh, support that. So, but we don't need that. Prefix, uh, oops. So here's the function. And here's the implicit, here's how that the implicit first block thing. So the first thing we do is we just make sure that we get a, um, a left, left brace. So like the, oh, the opening left brace here, but we don't consume it just yet. So the first thing we do is to create a node uh, to represent an implicit block zero. And we might use that, we might not. And then we also allocate the body node, uh, which is going to be a list node, which is, it's just the same as it sets the token, remember. Um, and why we do it here and then we do advance is because the implementation of our uh, make node function here takes the the uh, you know creates a, a node structure for us and it sets it to the current token in our case that's less interesting and then it sets its source position to the current source position from our scan state and this is kind of like the 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 key reason we're doing things this way so jumping back that means that the source position of our implicit block zero and body will be you know, this, the start of this, which semantically I think makes sense, right? So that like, when we think about, you know, where in the source is the, is the body, where does it start and begin? It's here. This is the body, right? Rather than like this or some, some abstract notion of, of things. And when it comes to the block, similarly, right? If there's an implicit block, where does that implicit block start? Does it start here or like at this token? Probably not, right? I think it, it kind of starts up here in the implicit block. So uh, that's what's going on. So both of these will get the source position set to this. And our block zero will uh, uh, will be used down here, right? So the next thing we do, so then we just consume that uh, uh, brace. And if we immediately get a, uh, a right-hand side brace, then we're just done. That it's just an empty function, right? So if it looks like this, then we just get a function without any body. Oh, let me say that. And so if we do have a body, so if, if the next token is not the, um, the ending brace there, then we see is, does the function start with a label? If it does not, we essentially just insert this block zero 
and we call this function that the um, go look at it. Let's see, what is this called? Uh, I think it's actually is like prefix label. Yeah, there we go. So here we have our parslet that is triggered for um, the the label, and so whenever we encounter a label, then this is called. We read the label's name. And then we just trim off the trailing colon here. We don't need that in the label name. And then what we do, we use this uh, breakout function here, this uh, assist function that, we, that we're going to use down here, an implicit block, uh, which essentially just reads a list of operations and, and assignments. If you remember what we have in our syntax here. So we have a, a block. Oh, I guess we call that block a block statement. Yeah. So it reads one or more block statements. Let's just lift that in here. I keep clicking on this. I'm gonna do this to a sec. And we actually define this as zero or more. So maybe we should update our syntax here. Like that. Okay. So this just reads zero more block statements that is correct yeah it reads zero more um so pretty straightforward but this is doing and it appends it to to this node that we pass in here right so it it, it calls this like list append function to just add things that it's parsing so it just keeps adding things un until it uh, it encounters either a uh, right hand brace the end of the input stream which that would be an error later on or uh, another label, which would be a start of another block. So it just keeps going until any of those conditions are true. And and then we use it, so we, we make use of that down here, right? So we synthesize the, the starting label here, and we have a constant for the first block, which is B0. Uh, oops, pardon me. And no matter if we did have an explicit opening block or if we synthesized one, Beyond this point, it doesn't matter anymore. Now we're just parsing um, and more blocks, right? Which might be no more, we might be done. It might just be a single block. Or if at this point we have another label uh, scanned, kind of line up for us um, by the scanner, then we'll just do the same thing. We'll just call our uh, block function that we looked at for scanning a block and uh, we're done. At this point, the body you now has a list of blocks. Let's run it again. Uh, another little detail is that now, since we have this implicit block name, users are going to be, or we're going to be able to reference that. So we're going to be able to do things like, do we have B0 here sometime, somewhere? I guess we don't. But like, let's say that we had b0 right of a reference trade like you're going to be able to reference this block zero here as the implicit block which i think for simplicity's sake we should just allow this otherwise it's going to be a special case to like remember if it's like entered or not anyhow since we can do this uh we also cannot allow uh any any block that is not the first block to be called block zero because like if we now do this right like this is ambiguous which block doesn't mention this one, or like the implicit block zero here, right? Um, I'm sure that there are fancy ways to solve this, like with, you know, auto-generated name up here, and then, you know, we can, we can try to be clever, but I think in practice, it will be just bad practice to allow uh, a label to be called B0, um, just as a convention, so I just decided to disallow that. So that's what, what this little code does. So if uh, if the block we just parsed here is the very first block in the function, so if it's the, um, sorry, if it is not the first, right? So if the if the list already has at least one item, so head is not null. Um, uh, what's going on? Oh, my keyboard. So if this is not null, it's clear. And the the name of the block that we just parsed is the B0 name. And I broke this out into a constant so I could change it later in the C to reference. Uh, then that's an error. I'm gonna get an error message. So now if I call this block zero, this is gonna complain. It's gonna say, 
Uh, on line nine here, a block named B0 must be the first block. So I thought it was kind of neat and ended up working out pretty well. So I think this is it for, for this part. What is next is to, I need to do a little bit of cleanup. This code is a little bit, it's a little bit inconsistent, a little bit messy. For example, there is this, uh, looking at this syntax again, right? There is a concept of an operation, an assignment with arguments. The parser right now does not, is not structured as nicely. It's looser than this. Um, and so I'm gonna clean that up and just straighten out the parser to part exactly that and nothing else and issue an error if it gets anything else. And after that point, I think what we will do is we'll be moving on to uh, code generation, which will be kind of exciting. We're getting one step closer down to our second big milestone of having a, a ready-made little sort of um, uh, interpretive program that we can just toss these little source files on soon. So we'll, we'll be generating these uh, virtual machine instructions at that point. Cool, I hope you enjoyed this one. Um, you know, chime in on Twitter or uh, reach out some other way if you if there are any questions or anything like that. And uh, I'll hope uh, to catch you in the next part.